you could very well do better on six than on eight. Th that's the interesting uh, point about the messiness of sleep. So most people seem to perform the best when they have like a regular sleep schedule. And I tend to believe that you can also perform relatively optimally with chaos of sleep, like a, a weird soup of like power naps and all nighters and all of that. As long as you're like happy <laughs> mm -hmm. doing what you love, Tell me what you think about this. I agree that one can have a dysregulated sleep schedule and still be a happy person and productive. I mean, much of my life, I've pulled all-nighters and slept weird schedules. You know, I think many people can probably relate to going to sleep, waking up four hours later, being up for an hour or two on your computer, then going back to sleep and getting amazing sleep the next day functioning. I think it's important that people have highlighted the importance of sleep and getting enough rest. You can do really well if you do what you say, which is you wake up, you don't want to start stressing about it, creating this meta stress about sleep. Being happy it is actually one of the most powerful things that you can do, not allowing yourself to go down that rabbit hole of stress. Happiness, joy, and pleasure in what you're doing creates a chemical milieu that provides more of the chemicals that allow for effort. So I think that limiting your stress and at least recognizing, okay, if you're pulling an all-nighter or you're somehow on messed up sleep, there is going to be a point in that 24-hour cycle where your brain is not trustworthy, where your mental state is not worth placing too much weight on because you are near that temperature minimum. And near that temperature minimum, which is correlates to that two hour, about two hours before you would normally wake up, the brain is hobbling along and anything you feel or think at that time should not be given too much value. But if you can trick yourself into thinking that's the pleasure point, you afford yourself a huge advantage. There's a study done by a colleague of mine at Stanford that showed that positive anticipation about the next day events actually is a powerful metric for creating quality sleep, even if the sleep is very reduced. Emily Hoagland did this study that showed looking at OCHEM performance on OCHEM scores. Okay, so organic chemistry at Harvard is a pretty tough subject, yeah. highly motivated. A number of very good control groups in this study. What she showed was that consistency of total sleep duration was far more important for performance on these exams than total sleep duration itself. Mm. So it's not that just getting more sleep allows you to perform better consistently getting about the same amount of sleep is better for performance, at least in, on Ochem, yeah. than just getting more. People that tell me that I should get eight hours of sleep, I I mean, I, I get it and you, they may be right, but they may be very wrong. And There's no evidence that eight is better than six, that you could very well do better on six than on eight. There are a few other things that um, turn out to be strong parameters for success in this domain. For instance, your entire life, waking or asleep, is broken up into these 90-minute ultradian cycles. If you look at ability to attend or do math problems or do anything, you know, drive, performance tends to ramp up slowly within a 90-minute cycle, peak, and then come down at the end of that 90-minute cycle. And in sleep, we go through these stage one, two, three, four, REM, et cetera. We'll talk more about that if you like. Those on 90-minute ultradian cycles as well. Ending your sleep after a 90 minute cycle at the, at the near the end of a 90 minute cycle, say at the end of six hours, in many cases is better for you than sleeping an additional hour, seven hours and waking up in the middle of an ultradian cycle. And there are a few apps that can measure this based on body movements and things like that, that have you, your alarm go off at the end of an ultradian yeah, cycle. Yeah. And if you wake up in the middle of an ultradian cycle, sometimes not always, you can be very groggy for a long period of time. I certainly do better on six hours than I do on seven. I happen to like an eight hour sleep. It feels great, but I haven't slept an entire eight hours without waking up in the middle of the night at some point in, I don't know, forever. I can't, I can't remember. It's probably some point in infancy, but, and I function well during the day. I think that that's a big, that's an important parameter is how do you feel during the day? Almost everybody experiences some sort of dip in energy in the late afternoon or what would correlate to their temperature peak. And that's a good time of day to get either a 90, 90 minute or less nap. Or if you're not a napper or you can't nap, feet elevated has been shown to be good for clear out of some of this um, 
the glymphatic system is this kind of like sewer system of the brain that you can clear stuff out. So legs elevated or one thing that I've, um, I'm a big proponent of and that my lab has been studying is what I, I now call NSDR, non-sleep deep rest. And this is just lying down. But non-sleep deep rest is allowing your system to drop into states of, of real calm that allow you to get better at falling asleep later. And they can be very restorative for cognitive and motor function. There's at least one study um, out of Denmark that shows that the basal, the basal ganglia, which is an area of the brain that's involved in motor planning and action, one of these 20 minute non-sleep deep rest protocols resets levels of neuromodulators like dopamine in the basal ganglia to the same levels that they were right after a long night's sleep. So I also respectfully uh, or semi-respectfully disagree with the idea that you can't recover lost sleep. What does that mean? I mean, that there's no IRS for sleep. So what does it mean to be in debt for sleep? If you're falling asleep during the day and you're sleepy, like you're falling asleep, that's a good sign of insomnia. It means you're not sleeping enough at night. If you're fatigued during the day, but you're not falling asleep, so you're just exhausted, but you're not finding yourself falling asleep in meetings and in conversation, then chances are you're fatiguing your system through something else, like a long run in the middle of the night in yeah, Boston or whatever yeah. it is that you're up to lately at uh, 3 a.m. I find that it's like magic that a short nap does as much good and often better than a longer one for me, for me, subjective. What experience. would be a longer one? Longer uh, than 90 minutes? No, no, like 90 minutes, or but longer than 90 minutes, like two hours. Yeah, that's dropping you, starting to drop you into REM sleep. And even if it's a tiny amount of REM sleep, people can come out of those naps kind of disoriented. Right. I think a 20 minute nap is pretty fantastic. What's a good one where you say to friends? Is 20 minutes a good 20 or 30 nap? minutes. 20 or 30 minutes, because you're going, unless you're sleep deprived, you're going to stay out of REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. If you're sleep deprived, you'll drop right into it. If you've ever traveled and you're really jet lagged, you go to the hotel, you lay down for one second, all of a sudden you're just like, you're you're in a psychedelic dream, um, which can be pretty great too. Um, <laughs> but I think that uh, 20, 30 minutes, and if you can't sleep, some people have trouble napping, then learning to relax the body as much as possible, like trying to remove all expression from your face, completely letting your body kind of float. If people have a hard time relaxing when they're awake, um, there's some terrific uh, clinically and research tested hypnosis protocols. So <laughs> hypnosis, awesome. is, hypnosis is just a matter of going deep relaxation, narrowing of context. And it's all self-imposed. A lot of people think that hypnosis is like the stage thing with the pendant mm -hmm. and the chicken. Yeah. But you can real hypnosis is self-hypnosis. You're learning to, it involves some shifts in the way that you, the, the hypnotic induction involves looking up, closing your eyes, slowly deep breath, and then imagining yourself floating. 